you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ruth chapter 1. The, uh, the whole setting of Ruth is an interesting one because you see, you see in, the, in the little sketch that we just did, you see how they left the land, they, they went to Moab, they moved, he picked his family up and moved them and all this kind of thing. But you have to understand what's going on here. And I want, I want to start out with this. Ruth chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. I just want you to listen. In the days when the judges ruled, there was famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. That is a key phrase there. It's a, it's a key for us to remember because it starts out, it says, in the days when the judges ruled. Now, you, if you've read Judges... Judges is a brutal book. Judges has a lot of weird things going on. It's a lot of mean people, and it's a lot of godlessness. It's a lot of sin. It's a lot of just craziness. And when you look at the book of Judges, it's the whole book is a cycle of sin is all it is. It's like you have the Israelites there, and, and they'll mess up. They'll do something uh, to sin against God. They'll rebel in their rebellion, they'll go to idolatry, and in that idolatry, then they'll fall deeper and deeper into it. Then they'll cry out to God. Then God comes with all his, his grace and mercy. He comes and sends them a judge, and the judge comes and leads them into a place of redemption, leads them out into deliverance. They get delivered. Everything's great. The judge ends up dying, and then they start it all over again. It's like a cycle of sin, and we talked about this a little bit Wednesday night, and I called it to my youth. I told them it's a cycle of stupid because what happened is they, they just kept doing the same thing over and over again. It's insanity why you feel like you can do that. So you've got Ruth and Elimelech and their two sons living in the midst of this. So Elimelech says, you know what, let's get out of here. We're going to take off. We're going to go to Moab because Moab is so much greater, full of pagan and, and crazy gods that everybody worships. It's so much better. So let's go there. There's a problem here because we look at it and go, okay, well, he was just taking his family away. There's a little bit of a problem because I believe that even when I'm not faithful, God's faithfulness is there. I believe that. I believe that when I'm doing something crazy or I'm maybe in a place in my life where I don't really want to be, I know that if I trust God enough, he's going to bring me through it. So there's, there's a little disconnect here. Today I want to talk about hope. How can this be about hope? If you look at this story and you look at what's going on, how can there be any hope there? In this story... You have some crazy things going on. And I want to talk about four characters today that are in this story that I feel are key to us growing in our relationship with God. Because the first thing we have to do is we have to ask ourselves, have we ever experienced pain? Because you're going to see in just a minute how there's some pain going on. Because what happens is when they leave Bethlehem and they go into Moab, Elimelech dies. And so does their two sons. So you have a lady named Naomi. Who's heard of Naomi before? You have Naomi who is now grieving. She's just lost her husband. She's lost both her sons. What is she supposed to do? So then you have Orpah and Ruth. Orpah and Ruth are the daughters-in-law. They've lost their husbands. It's a whole story of heartbreak at the beginning. They leave their land, they leave their community, they leave their family, they leave everything they know to go to a foreign land with foreign gods, and all of a sudden the head of the household, Elimelech, dies and his two sons die. So you've got three widows sitting here looking at God going, what am I supposed to do now? It's a difficult situation. Has anybody ever been in a difficult situation in your life? I've gone through some things where I didn't know how I was going to come out. I've gone through things where I saw all black in the tunnel. There was no light. In those moments, you have to reach your hand out and believe that God's hand is there too to help pull you through it. So I want to talk about hope today. Ruth chapter 1 verse 6. 
I'm going to go ahead and read this to you because I want you to hear it. So if we have uh, verse 6 through 13, we can go ahead and throw it up there. Stay with me. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. Remember, all the guys, all the men are dead at this point. With their two, with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in some other husband, in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and she wept aloud and said to her, we will go back to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. So what's going on here is Naomi saying, listen, you guys, there is nothing here for you. If you stay with me, you're going to be a bitter old woman just like I am. You're going to be mad. You're going to be upset. And there's going to be nothing here. So what you need to do is you need to go back to Moab. You need to go back to your homes. You need to go back and you need to find yourself a husband, find yourself a man, you need to make some babies because that's what you want in the long run. You want some kids, so go make some babies. Go start your family and be happily ever after. Don't bother me because this is what Naomi's doing. Right now, she's saying, woe is me. I am pitiful. I am a sorry excuse for a human being, and God hates me, so you need to get away from me or you're going to end up the same way. That's what Naomi's doing to them right now. She's throwing a pity party for herself in the midst of all this. You guys need to go back. Just go back home. You go back and raise your kids up where there's foreign gods and all this kind of thing, even though Naomi knows the truth. She is insisting that they leave. So when you look at all this, you think, okay, what do they do? Well, they do the normal thing and say, no, we're not going to leave you. We're not going to leave you. And then Orpah... She looks at her and she goes, and the Bible says, while she's crying, says, okay, and she leaves. She takes the first opportunity she can to get out of Dodge to go back because she wants that. But Ruth, the Bible says in verse 14 that Ruth clung to her side. Now you have to think, this is where it's interesting. These are Israelites. These are people who know the one true God in Elimelech and Naomi. Orpah and Ruth are from Moab. They're not Israelites. So Ruth, she says, and you can read it in scripture, she says, I'm going to basically, I'm going to adopt your faith. I'm going to believe in your God, and I'm going to be one with you and your people. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have faith in the God that you've taken your faith out of. That's what's going on with Ruth right now. She's saying, I'm going to stay with you. I believe I'm going to stay. Now, Naomi obviously had given up hope. And we, it may sound like I'm being a little hard on Naomi here because we all have those moments where we give up hope, right? Has anybody ever given up hope? You just kind of said, forget it, I'm done. If you haven't, I want to meet you because you're so much better than me. It's hard not to sometimes. It's hard when your world seems to be falling apart and you don't know what to do about it. People are in pain. People are hurting. You got stuff going on in your life and you don't know how to get past it. It's hard not to give up hope. Wow. It's awesome. When hard times come in life, every person responds differently. Would you agree with that? Every person does, because we all have personalities. God creates in each one of us different personalities. You have a different personality than I do. Because as my mom used to tell me, when God created me, she broke, he broke the mold. You ever heard that one before? Yeah, so you don't have the same personality as me. But the question you have to ask yourself is, even though we all respond differently, how do you respond personally when things in life seem to go wrong? 
when things seem to fall apart, how do you respond? How do you respond to your situations that are out of control? We are human. There's sin in this world, and suffering is real. We can't minimize that. We can't minimize that, you know what? Bad things are going to happen to good people. Get over it. It's going to happen. You know why? Because we live in a broken world with broken people who do broken things. So broken things are going to take place. So we have to get real. Let's, let's get the realness in front of us today before we can go any further. I had a friend of mine, he used to tell me I would get in Naomi pity parties and just God's mad at me. He would look at me and he'd go, suck it up and deal with it. God is bigger than your problem. And I remember that. I still remember it. Sometimes, you know what? It's okay to just kind of say, I don't know what's going on. But when we start wallowing in it, we can't allow God to operate in that area of our life because we push him out. We become unfaithful to a faithful God. There are people possibly here today who can't pay their bills. There are people who are in between jobs that are looking for jobs to support their family. There are people in this world who are dying to have children. They can't have children. So they see that as suffering. There are people who are sick and are dying, don't know what to do anymore. This is real stuff. This is life. This is real life. Very quickly, I want to show you the different ways in which people handle suffering that come their way in the story of Ruth. And I want you to ask yourself, where do I place hope in the midst of my suffering? Where do you place it? First person I want to look at, I told you there was four key characters. First person I want to look at is Elimelech. He controls his suffering. If you think about it, he puts hope, and this is number one, he puts hope in nothing. He puts hope in nothing. When conditions got hard, he tried to control his suffering as to avoid it altogether. Things are bad. There's famine here. There's bad things happening. God's judgment's everywhere. The wrath of God must be coming. Come on, family, let's go. Never once in Scripture do you see where Elimelech got on his face before a faithful and just God and said, what can you do to pull me out of this? You don't see that. You don't see any repentance for sin. You don't see those things. You see him grab his family together and run to a foreign land. Matter of fact, a foreign land with foreign gods. So he escapes God's land for a land of foreign gods. He doesn't trust the faithfulness of God, and he was God's people. So it's not about whether you're saved or unsaved or believe or not believe. It's about whether you believe that God is faithful or not. He uproots his family, moves to a paganized land full of foreign gods, away from their family, away from their community, and ultimately to his death. It wasn't until he moved to Moab that he died. He died. Faithlessness. I want you to hear this. I need everybody to hear this. Faithlessness is not simply making ungodly decisions. It's making decisions without God. That's faithlessness. Second person I want to show you is Orpah. Orpah runs from suffering. She puts hope in false gods. Okay? Now, honestly, like I said a minute ago, we could probably see where this is pretty reasonable. I mean, your mother-in-law just told you, listen, I'm going to be a bitter old woman and I'm never going never gonna to really be happy, seems like. So you don't need to stay with me because if you stay with me, you're going to end up the same way. So why don't you just go on back to your mom and dad's house? Why don't you go back, find your man, have some babies, live happily ever after? Most of us can probably look at that as a reasonable thing to say. I mean, hey, she just told me to do it. She don't want my help because that's when you, when you read the scripture, it says she cried for a minute, then she said okay and left. So 
it's almost like you look at Orpah and you go, okay, what she did was she looked at her. She's like, no, I don't want to leave you. And when she said, yeah, you need to leave, she went, okay. And she left. She took off. She went back to Moab and did what she told her to do. She puts hope in false gods. This is the ordinary human response to a bad situation that's out of our control. And this is where faith comes in. Do we have the faith to trust God's faithfulness to us even in the hardest of situations? Orpah lost faith and ran back to the arms of the false gods in Moab. She ran. Third thing, the third person I want to show you is Naomi. We've talked about Naomi for a minute, but Naomi sits in suffering. She puts hope in nothing. She puts hope in nothing. She became a bitter old woman that returned to Bethlehem. As a matter of fact, she changed her name to Mara, which means the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She changed her, she went as far to change her name in the midst of her bitterness. She changed her name. But the fact is, just like today, more than likely, it's us who turn away from God, not God turning away from us. Did you hear that? We're the ones that turn away from God. God doesn't become unfaithful to us. We become unfaithful to him. Bitterness can blind us to truth. Bitterness will take away all faith and reason. Listen to this. And put us in victim mode rather than allowing us to walk in victory. If you allow bitterness to creep into your life, you will never walk in victory, but you will always walk around as the victim in your own mind. Bitterness will exaggerate our sense of hopelessness. It blinded Naomi from seeing that God had blessed Bethlehem and brought her back just in time for the harvest. Remember, when they left, they were going through famine. And now, by God's sovereignty, he has turned this whole situation around. Even though Elimelech left, took off, He's making a way for Naomi to come back now, and she can't see that. All she sees is bitterness in front of her. She don't see the harvest that's waiting ahead. The fourth person I want to show you is Ruth. Ruth presses into suffering. She puts hope in faith. She puts it in faith. Ruth was, was not a Jewish person, but she experiences redemption. She experienced the same suffering as everyone else, but responds completely different. She responds completely different to the situation. She doesn't try to control. She doesn't run. She doesn't remain bitter. In fact, she walks deeper into suffering. She recognizes her helplessness, but never gets to a place of hopelessness. It's okay to feel helpless. Listen, it's okay to feel helpless. But you have to understand in your helplessness, there is hope in him. And you have to also understand that nobody on this planet is hopeless. Nobody, nobody sitting in this room, nobody that you know is hopeless. They just may be without a little hope. And that's our job to give it to them. She has no husband, no family, no job. But the little hope she has, we see that she faithfully walks towards God, not by sight, but by faith. If you read the rest of the story, you'll see the blessings that come in Ruth's life. And I believe those blessings come because God blesses those who press on after him. When you press on to God, he's going to bless you. He's going to bring you blessing. But when you sit around like a bitter old person who just rots away in bitterness, I told him in first service, when you're bitter, it not only affects you, but it affects everybody around you. 
People around you can see that you're bitter. People around you can see that your attitude has changed. Something's different. And if we don't get past that bitterness, I promise you, if we don't lay the bitterness down, you're going to become a poison. And you're going to become a cancer to people around you. I believe that there's hope in suffering. I believe in the pain that we go through in life, there's hope there. God hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't forgotten about us. A lot of times we get this idea that if we do certain things in life, if we make certain mistakes, if we, if we make bonehead decisions or about this or that, then God is going to just leave us alone. He's going to abandon us. The fact is God runs closer to us because he wants us to run to him. Many of you are here today maybe suffering in some way. And honestly, I can't tell you why beyond the fact that we live in a fallen world. I don't know why things happen. I have no idea. But I can tell you the how. When you run to Jesus, when you run to God, when you have faith in him, when you do as Ruth did, and you say, God, I don't understand everything, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have faith in you. Things start happening. Belief in Jesus will not take away tragedy. I want you to listen to this. But I do promise you, it'll be a lot easier to get through. Tragedies are going to come. Pain is going to come. Suffering is going to come. And a non-believer or, or an unbeliever may go through the same exact same thing as a believer. But they should experience them just a little different. Because the believer has faith that God is there. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask everyone to just bow your heads and close your eyes and not only respect for those around you, but to help our focus a little bit. I'm going to ask you three questions. That's it. Three different responses. The first one is this. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You've never asked him to be your personal Lord and Savior. But you know you need him. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've been running from God. You've been running away. You've been running the opposite direction. This morning, you need to turn yourself around and you need to run back to him. If that's you, if you say, pray for me, I would like to receive Christ this morning. Or you say, pray for me, I've been running from God and I just need to run back. If that's you, will you just lift your hand so I can see it? Anyone at all? Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Here's the next thing I want to ask. Maybe you're here this morning and you sit in bitterness. You have become a bitter person. You're angry at either somebody or you're angry at God. And maybe you realize you're never going to change if you don't allow God to change you. And until you lay that bitterness down, until you lay it down, you're going to continue to be bitter. If you say this morning, pray for me, I need to get rid of this. And hands are already going up. If that's you, lift your hands. Thank you. All over the place. My friends, Mike and Tasha are going to be up here at the front to pray with you guys. 
if you would like prayer this morning, if you would like to come, if you lifted your hand, if you didn't lift your hand, whatever, if you would like prayer, we're up here. I'm going to pray for you this morning. And as I'm praying, if you would like to step out from where you're at, like I said, Mike and is up here, and, and uh, they'll be happy to pray for you. If you'd like to step out where you're at and come up and get prayer this morning, completely welcome. Lord, I just ask you this morning, Jesus, to Lord, continue the work you've began. Lord God, I know that our hearts hurt sometimes. I know that suffering and pain comes, Lord. And God, I know that your word says joy comes in the morning, but sometimes we don't know when that morning's going to be. God, I ask you right now, Lord, to help every person in this room see the sunset or see the sunrise, Lord. May we see the morning on the horizon. May we see it coming, Lord, in our life and in our situations. God, for those that have lifted their hand this morning that need to come to you, that need to run back to you, Lord, I pray, God, right now that you'll begin prompting them to run, run back to Jesus. God, for those in here this morning who are eaten up with bitterness, who maybe don't know what to do, need your help, Lord. I pray, God, right now that you'll begin to minister to them. Lord, break our hearts for more of you so that we can be less like us. Lord, I love you this morning. I thank you for every person here this morning, God. And I ask for your blessings on their life. Lord, that you will change us from the inside out, God. Lord, I pray that every time we close our eyes, we see Jesus, that we might be reminded who you are in our lives. God, if there's anyone here today that maybe they don't know you, I pray, God, that you'll begin right now moving in their life. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, if you would like prayer, Mike and Tasha are up here. We're up here. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Thank you for coming. See you Wednesday night.